virtual agents, AI that sounds and talks just like yeah. us, um, that will come. The question is for consumers, how will we react to that? You're listening to CX Passport, the show about creating great customer experiences with a dash of travel talk. Each episode, we'll talk with our guests about great CX, travel, and just like the best journeys, explore new directions we never anticipated. I'm your host, Rick Denton. I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Let's get going. When you're using the hashtag Star Wars lessons for your LinkedIn post, you're going to stand out. Now, couple that with actual, solid customer experience lessons in those Star Wars posts, and you're offering some intriguing wisdom nuggets. Okay, so that's written content. Not satisfied with one medium, today's guest also hosts a respected customer experience podcast, Next in Q, and it finds a, a specific, unique pop culture reference and hook for each guest. The last two at the time of this writing was a Twisted Sister song and a grand musical number for South Park. Uh, y- y- folks, it puts my little cheeky friends styled titles to shame. I love seeing what this guest puts together for his podcast intros. So viewers and listeners, I've always said that I wanted interesting conversations with interesting people. And I am confident that today's chat with Rob Dwyer, VP customer engagement at happy to will fit that bill. Rob self-declared sweet spot is the contact center. And I really enjoy getting those insights in front of the CX Passport Traveler as that's where I've often said, that's the gold mine of customer understanding at the contact center. It is often overworked. It is often underutilized. And it is absolutely the epicenter of rich, rich customer insight. Plenty of change exists in that contact center world, amplified even further in 2023 with the heavy focus on AI solutions. It'll be interesting to hear Rob's perspective on that. And travelers, you won't have to go to a galaxy far, far away as Rob comes to us from Kansas, just a few states up the road from me here in Texas. So put away your lightsaber, channel the force, and join me in hyperspace. Rob, welcome to CX Passport. Thanks, Rick. You know, it's uh, it's been one of my uh, dreams to appear on your fantastic show. So Aww. thank you so much. Well, thank you. Oh, that warms my heart right off the start, Rob. I really, really appreciate that. And for listeners, I would recommend that at least take a peek over at the YouTube channel so that you can see Rob's brilliant background here and understand why I mentioned so many Star Wars references <laughs> as it is clearly special and dear to him. Rob, I do want to start with something simple, though. Why the contact center? I, I know it's near and dear and sweet and important to me as well, but why is that? Why is the contact center your sweet spot? Yeah, I feel like it is where the rubber meets the road. Mm-hmm. You can have all of the products and services and great marketing and all of that. But when a customer has a challenge, a problem, a question, it comes into the contact center. And that's where you really find out how customers are experiencing your product or service. (laughs) Right. And that's why I love it. Yeah, man, I want to ask you so, so many other questions about that. So why is it? Okay. I don't think you and I can answer the question I was about to ask. I'll ask it differently. How is it that we've come to a world where we, you and I, and many others think that the contact center is so vitally important. And we recognize that is where experience is co-created. And yet it gets diminished. I mentioned it being oft overworked and underutilized. Why? Why is that the case when that's this rich source of customer insights? Yeah, I think for a lot of companies, like a lot of other different functions, it has been traditionally viewed as a cost center. And so... Uh, unless you are in a contact center that is also driving sales or driving Mm -hmm. upsell or cross sell or whatever the case may be. When you think about the service side of it, customer service or customer support, companies often view that in a lens of this is a cost. This impacts the bottom line in a negative way. And so they try to minimize that impact and that, 
comes with a lot of consequences. It could come from <laughs> the pay. It could yeah. be related to uh, outsourcing, offshoring. Uh, it could just not get the attention that it deserves because we're focused on these other aspects of the business. There are just lots of different variables, but you put them all together and often the the contact center is not viewed as the rich data source that it can be. And you know what? That's not the fault of the contact center. As I'm sitting here thinking about that, as, as you're saying that out loud, and, and we know that, right? But it just the thought comes to the top of that. It's not the contact center's fault. It's the company's fault for not tapping into that. And there's this cycle that hopefully folks like you, folks like me, will start to break when we realize that the contact center has such that rich insight, has is that epicenter, and would be valuable to those that, well, Maybe some of the other letters, CFO, other type labels that may not think of it in, in that way, but rather think of it as that cost center, open their eyes to how one could really actually not just get insights, but then do something with it, get business results out of it. And I know a lot of the way folks are seeing that start to change, I alluded it to, alluded to it in the intro that in 2023, the, the two letters, right? The, the big letters that are part of every conversation that I feel like I'm a part of. Heck, I just read a, a newsletter today, the Neuron. It's a great AI newsletter. And they were talking about being at a conference and even the housekeeping staff was talking to him about AI. So everyone is talking about AI. Yeah. But I like to start contrarian for a second. You'd mentioned this to me before that you know, since everyone, and I use that with air quotes, says you must move to AI now, who shouldn't? Who should not be running towards technology and AI right now? This is a great question. I think you can utilize technology in just about any business sense, right? No matter what kind of work that you do, for the most part, technology can be a part of that. And then maybe AI can be a part of that. The question is, do you have well thought out goals that you want to achieve? And do you know how? a particular AI enabled tool will help you get there. That's the thing that I think there are a lot of questions about is AI means a lot of different things. It is <laughs> not one thing. Right, there is, right. uh, even among generative AI, there mm -hmm. are lots of different applications for that. It's not all just chat GPT. I think that's the one that we all hear all the time, but that's not the only type of generative AI. And so just understanding what kind of AI am I using and what goals is it going to allow me to accomplish and what are the risks associated with that? And those risks could include, for instance, legal risk. And so right. doing a very a thorough analysis on understanding why I want to do it, what success is going to look like. If you haven't done those things, then just stop. This is your captain speaking. I want to thank you for listening to CX Passport today. We've now reached our cruising altitude, so I'll turn that seatbelt sign off. While you're getting comfortable, hit that follow or subscribe button on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Love it if you'd tell a friend about CX Passport, leave a review so others can discover the show as well. Now, sit back and enjoy the rest of the episode. And, and I, Rob, I like how you pivoted that way because I think when I asked it, I thought you might have said that you know this industry or this role or this type of contact center, that sort of thing might not be. I like what you're saying is it still goes back to there's probably a use for technology for every business. Every company has some use for AI be it generative, whether it be uh, language models, whatever the technology is, because you're right, even I am absolutely guilty of saying AI in such a generic sort of way when it really means all these independent right. little slivers that have different usages. Instead saying of an industry that shouldn't do it, rather it's if you haven't done your work to get ready for it. And one of the areas of that frustrate me when I am talking to potential clients or even just in LinkedIn conversations is how it's become such a, a tool, especially in the contact center for how we could cut costs. And while cost cutting can be a great uh, outcome of this, if that's the initial objective, well then guess what? You are likely 
uh, going to diminish the experience and you aren't going to get the outcome that you'd hoped for. So let's, let's, let's take what you just said about if you are prepared and if, or if you're preparing, I got a listener out there, a viewer out there that is saying, okay, I'm interested in this. If I want to be prepared, if I want to be in a sense that I've got my goals set and there's a ton of opportunity with generative AI, where is it going and how should, if I'm running a contact center, how should I utilize it? Yeah, well, where is it going? I think <laughs> is still an open question that there, Come on. I, I don't think anyone- That was the main question. That. I buried the lead. That's what I, I want to ask you about is where is it going? Come on, Rob. I think, <laughs> I think predicting the future is always dangerous uh, <laughs> to, to a certain extent. And if I had known when I was a kid and I hooked up my first modem to my Commodore 128 and chatted Ooh. with my neighbor, what that would eventually turn into. If I could predict the future then, I uh, would be probably on an island in the Bahamas somewhere, not talking to you, just enjoying <laughs> you, you wouldn't care a lick about tech or generative uh, AI. You would just care about where that next margarita came from. Right. So uh, I'm not in the business of, of predicting the future. But Wise what I choice. will say is it is coming in many different forms to contact centers. It is absolutely mm -hmm. coming and in many cases is already there. I think the best today, the best use case is for supporting those agents who are supporting your customers. And so that may mean that uh, you are doing some analysis on performance so that you can better coach and develop your agents so that they um, really interact with your customers more effectively, more efficiently. It mm -hmm. could be that you're giving them some real-time guidance to help support them. Um, there are lots of different things that you can be doing in the contact center. Um, I do think for better or for worse, that virtual agents, AI that sounds and talks just like you are, well, okay, it's not going to talk just like you or I, but it probably well, could I, be programmed to talk yeah. just like yeah. us. Um, that will come. The effectiveness uh, is yet to be seen, but it will come. And the question is for consumers, how will we react to that? Will we be accepting of it? Will we not be accepting of it? And will we sit through a phone conversation? And I do mean conversation with yeah. a bot that sounds like a human. I think at some point, to some extent, we probably will. Yeah, I'm, I'm slightly wondering if you're influenced by that love of Star Wars, right? Where we do see a future <laughs> where that is something that is not surprising and very common, right? I mean, yeah. I guess you could say that C-3PO is a phenomenal AI bot, right? <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. in a totally different format. I don't want to offend any Star Wars people. I love the show. I don't know if I just said something that I shouldn't have, but he kind of reminds me of that. Um, that is interesting, though. Uh, when I think of how I naturally react when I'm presented with a chatbot, even before I've had my first interaction with it, I'm pissed off yeah. because I've been exposed to so many bad experiences mm. with a, a bot that – it doesn't matter how good it actually ends up being. I'm already sort of pissed off yeah. and I'm wondering bot baggage, <laughs> the one with bot baggage. I think you just gave us the title <laughs> of the episode, Rob. Wow. I've never even thought of that, but yeah, I do. And so yeah. as we take that forward, when you talk about that being a benefit of being something that you see it going that direction, let's talk about from today to that future, what needs to happen to make that be something that would be appealing to the mm -hmm. customer. That would be something the customer would not retch or clench up like I do about a bot, but instead welcome and eagerly interact with. Well, I think you, you're going to need two things, right? It's going to be time and it's going to be good experiences replicated mm -hmm. over and over. Every bad experience kind of sets us back. We have a tendency to, to remember those bad experiences more than, than the, okay, that was a satisfactory <laughs> experience. Right. And so right. we as consumers, 
as people are going to need time and we're going to need a lot of experiences that reinforce that, hey, maybe this isn't so bad because you're right. Uh, it's not just you. A lot of us are going to cringe the first time we recognize I'm not talking to another person. I'm talking to a machine and I have had bad experiences. I've got that yeah. bot baggage. And so I'm automatically biased and inclined not to even want to continue to move forward. And right. that's a challenge that, that has to be overcome. I think, you know, something else that's coming to mind, Rob, that you're saying there is so much of that is it has to be positive experience. And there's so many things that are well beyond the scope of this podcast that are, okay, so how do we technologically create that? How do we create a data set upon which that uh, virtual assistant rests to where that virtual assistant can have a natural conversation? How do they make it sound natural? All those things could be an expanded episode that's well <laughs> beyond my skill set. I think another element is transparency. And I mm -hmm. try to think back to the original era of bots. And I don't know, I don't even know if I can really remember that. It felt like a lot of companies were trying to sneak it past you at first. You know, and, and, and so you're, you think you're chatting with a human or something like that. And, and there was that sneaking it past. I think being honest with the customer up front of, hey, this is our virtual assistant or and somebody will come up with a better name. And you're interacting with them conversationally and let's just have a conversation with them being honest about it. Heck, the novelty factor of that alone might get people over that bot baggage that I'm describing if we're being honest about it up front and not trying to hide behind, ooh, I'm doing a cost cutting measure and hoping that the customer doesn't notice as opposed to here's a better experience. And I want the customer to notice and embrace this because I think it's awesome and you customer, I want it to be awesome too. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I do think we are being, in some ways, I don't want to say trained, it almost sounds nefarious, but we are using voice enabled assistance today. Many oh, of sure. us, right. Right. Yeah. right? Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, those things. So we're mm -hmm. starting to interact more and more uh, with machines by voice. And I think that will help the transition. There are still going to be situations where it's not appropriate. We should offer oh, yeah. up human support. And there are going to be people who just never want to talk to a machine. And I get right. it. <laughs> but there let's will provide be a vehicle a for happy them, right? medium probably yeah. Yeah. that we end up with. You're, Rob, absolutely right. If I'm calling into a health insurance company and I'm struggling with the fact that they have not adequately paid for the cancer treatment that I felt like they needed to be pay, paying for, uh, there's, there's, it's unlikely that I see in my lifetime and maybe my children and grandchildren's lifetimes a scenario where a bot is going to manage that with the empathy that I expect and demand as a human. Could be wrong, so I, 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 but there will be scenarios where I would be happy to have that conversation. Let's go. Let's actually take that one step further. So that's exactly what I just said. There kind of lent itself towards hype, and we're hearing a ton of hype that, oh my gosh, technology will do everything for us by the final four in twenty twenty four. It'll be amazing at that point, uh, listeners. Rob is a Kansas fan. I'm a Duke fan. And so the final four is very special to both of us. But how are you, Rob, separating that hype versus reality in the domain? How are you able to listen to, okay, no, this sounds like something that's actually real. This vendor is truly using an actual upgrade in AI as opposed to just a niftier chat bot. And then how do you mm -hmm. use that to make sure you're getting to a better experience? Yeah, that is really a challenge uh, for a couple of reasons, right? There are all kinds of different options, vendors out there who are in the pace, the pace of development is moving so quickly that it makes it really difficult to go, you know, is that, is that even possible? Is that real? What I would say is whether something is possible and whether or not it can actually be done today with, with the technology that maybe you are about to, to purchase for your company, those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say you need to be, um, one, you need to have a good relationship with whatever vendor you're going to go with so that uh, if things are, are not what you thought they were, that you can have that legitimate conversation. And the other thing that I would be wary of, particularly today, 
at the pace that things are changing is I would be wary of entering into a long-term contract with a company that hasn't proven itself to me. If you've proven yourself to me and I know that you're delivering value, then okay, now we can we can talk about that. But the pace of change and development is moving at such a breakneck speed today that if I were a company, I would want to keep my options open and I would want my partners, whatever technology they're providing, to really prove their worth to me. Rob, th- that was a valuable nugget. I like that idea of, yeah, I'm not going to get into a long-term relationship unless I trust you. It's sort of the 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 marriage relationship of technology vendor and and company. Mm-hmm. I want to change the pace on you a little bit here. And and you and I were talking mm-hmm. before we hit record how you recently had an I-35 trip from Kansas down to a city just outside of San Antonio. And uh, I, I don't even drive to San Antonio. I fly from Dallas. And, and while the rest stops are nice, actually, the Texas rest stops are very nice. They may not be first class lounge worthy. So I want to invite you today into a real first class lounge. Let's take a break. Let's enjoy this here. We are going to move quickly here and hopefully have a little bit of fun. What is a dream travel location from your past? From my past? I, I think it came up already. The Bahamas. I uh, really i have only been once, but let me tell you, that was an amazing Boy, to, to have a <laughs> – so I guess I mentioned margarita. I guess that would be a little more of a rum drink that you'd be seeking in your island if you'd gotten that crystal ball back with your Commodore 128. Yeah, strawberry daiquiris. That's where it's Oh, yes. A uh, tasty one. My dad would always make lime daiquiris at home. Now, I should do an aside here. Commodore 128, you were fancy. I only knew the Commodore 64. All right. You were you were doubling oh, up the, yeah, uh, the power double there. double it. <laughs> double it. It was, a, it was a little bit uh, deeper of a machine. And, um, yeah, you know, that was what I grew up with. And there is now two thirds of the CX passport audience that just went Commodore. (laughs) What, what is this thing they're talking about? Go Google it and you'll see, uh, the the origins of, of, (laughs) yeah, that's right. Oh my goodness. Well, what is a dream travel location you've not been to yet? Italy has always been on my bucket Mm. list and I've been to Europe, but I have not been to Italy yet. You will eat well. You will, your eyes will just be amazed with the beauty and you will drink well if that is a choice of yours. And even if it is not, you will eat like a king. Oh, that's an awesome place to have in that dream travel location. Speaking of eating, well, actually, what is a favorite thing of yours to eat? So I do love all kinds of Italian food, but if I really have to just say, like, this is, this is my last meal, just give me a good rare steak, some mm. nicely grilled asparagus, maybe some some mashed potatoes or a grilled potato of some sort and a nice bottle of Cabernet and I'm going to be a happy man. All right. So next time you do this Kansas to San Antonio, you will be passing by. Well, you probably do 35W, but take the 35E branch, come over. Let's go have a, a steak dinner here in the uh, the North Texas area, and then I'll send you on your way. Uh, and you'll okay. get a nice one. I like that favorite meal. Let's go the other way. What is something growing up you were forced to eat, but you hated as a kid? Saying that Popeye eats it does not make <laughs> spinach any better. I tried. I tried. My mom tried. My grandmother even tried. But canned spinach is awful. Isn't that amazing how many, how many parents attempted to use Popeye as a way? Your, your muscles are going to pop out. At, uh, no, it still tastes like crap. I'm not going to eat it. Mm-hmm. Now I love spinach now. But my goodness, I hated it too. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. I'm- Fresh spinach, delicious. Oh yeah, that sure. And slimy. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, no perfect. go for you. Well, let's go back and let's close out the lounge. Back to travel item. What is one travel item, not including your phone, not including your passport, that you will not leave home without? I mean, when you've got a mane like this, you've got to bring the beard conditioner. That's <laughs> shout out to Scotch Porter. That's uh, that's my brand of choice. I've got to make sure and and condition the main. Well, Rob, it is a well conditioned main, and I can see it. And viewers, I know you can see it as well. It looks fantastic. 
Now, I don't think you had the condition main back in this stage of life. And this question may catch you off guard a bit, but I'm curious. I've got a son who is a ref. He's done soccer refing uh, as his kind of since he was in middle school. And now he does it as a college age kid. I know that you've been an NCAA baseball umpire for 18 plus years. Now, my son shared wild stories with me. I guarantee you've had some wild stories. So along with some fun storytelling, how has that experience of being an umpire influenced your approach to customer experience today? Well, I think there's a couple things. The first and foremost, the, the one thing that I learned to hone in that role was communication. Mm -hmm. It is so valuable. And being able to communicate effectively with people to understand where they're coming from allows you to focus on moving toward a resolution. But the one thing that I never expected to learn as I was an umpire, and this is true, especially as you, as you move up into high school and college, is that those coaches who are getting maybe upset at a particular call, it's their job that is potentially on the line for every call that that you maybe missed. So literally their job is to some extent at the mercy of how well you do your job. So if you blow a bunch of calls in a game that's really important to them, they miss the playoffs, that, that could be their livelihood that's at stake. And I think as you think about how we interact with our customers, regardless of what it is that you're doing, but certainly if you're in, you know, a SaaS provider or mm. if you are, you know, in a BPO or whatever the case may be, right? The job that you do impacts other people and their jobs. And so understanding how important it is to, do a great job so that other people can execute on their job effectively yeah. and you're not impacting them negatively. I think that was one of the biggest lessons that I had to learn because I definitely did not understand that early on. I mean, I started doing that when I was like 21 and uh, that was not even part of my thought process. Right. I was just <laughs> still trying to figure out like, how to um, how to be a halfway decent official. I was pretty bad to start. But as you really move up into those higher ranks, it isn't just a game. It yeah. literally is people's livelihoods. And so that's that's a really important lesson that I would say to anyone out there who's thinking of being an official. Um, take it seriously. It, it really, and it's important to the players too, right? Uh, yeah. For them to know that you are doing your best, that you're um, working your tail off and that you want to just get the call right. And when you do that, almost every coach and player will recognize it and you'll gain their yeah. respect. And then you have far less problems on the field. Yeah. That, I, you, you may have seen my kind of, hmm, and the, I, I, I've asked this question of other umpires before. I've even asked it of my son, and he's not in the customer experience space at all. And I, I've heard things like, you know, communication and, you know, that idea of trying to just manage a situation. Imagine a customer service trying to manage a situation. But that, you kind of went sort of that, we use it too often, but that, empathy, right? Understanding mm -hmm. where they're coming from more specifically that if you screw up, not just the empathy of, oh, I just want to understand where they're coming from and their experience, but understanding it to the degree of that if you screw up, you have cost them uh, elements of, of their possible in, in, the ability to generate income for themselves and for their families, right? And that, mm -hmm. 
that kind of surprised me. I, I, I was not expecting to hear that. It is amazing. I, I wonder how many of the best customer experience people, customer service people have something like that in their background. It's almost as we should consider perhaps a contact center training ground that you, you have to go ref some intramural <laughs> games or you have to go, you have to go. It seems like parents get worse up to about age 13, then they start to mellow out. So go ref like a, a U12 soccer game and then become a customer customer service agent, you got it nailed. You, you got, it's a, you've already got the hard stuff out at that point. <laughs> I will say, I think you've got the age just about right. 12 and under is yeah. really the, the most difficult age group of, and it doesn't matter the sport. That's where you will find, uh, for whatever reason, the most difficult parents to deal with That's right. as well. <laughs> the, the most insults coming from, from the stands, all of that. I, th I think it's because at that age, every parent still believes that their child is the next athletic star. And by the time they've hit 13, they realize that either they actually are, right? You can see that trajectory in many, or, oh, okay, well, never mind. Let's find another pass. So maybe I'll quit my griping from the sidelines. So. Right. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, Rob, thank you for that. I, I, I really enjoyed talking about the umpiring, the refing, and how that influences customer experience to the point that I'm looking down and realize, oh my gosh, we're already at a half hour. I do want to ask you one thing though, and I know that is you do work for Happy To, right? And that is in the software space. And we talked about how it, knowing why you purchase it, why you get into that. And often software and these tech tools and general often the, the sexy purchase right something a company mm -hmm. just goes after because they know well gosh i need technology we talked earlier about the customer being in a, in a, a trying to coach them on how not to do that path but i want to think of it kind of almost from your perspective as inside the software vendor how are you making sure that people that companies aren't just buying the tech because it's sexy but because they're actually using it to accomplish a better experience yeah. Well, I mean, the first part just goes into those initial conversations and asking mm -hmm. those questions like, what are you trying to accomplish? First and foremost, because if you're trying to accomplish something that we can't help you with, you right. need to get that out of the way in a hurry. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you blaming me <laughs> that we couldn't accomplish something when I should have known that from, from right. the first moment that, that we talked. But I think from then on, it's also about that continued partnership and finding out how you're using our products, how we can make them better and understanding what it is that you are accomplishing and what you want to try to accomplish in the future. And so as long as we keep that partnership, that open dialogue between us and we really approach things as partners, I think we remain very confident that either we're doing something that's important and good for your organization, or potentially we're not. And in that case, it may be a matter of just asking, what can we do? And I will tell you, our uh, vision product actually came out of a conversation where we, somebody else wanted a different product that we offered. And we said, this isn't going to accomplish what you think it's going to accomplish, but let's see if huh. we can solve some problems that you have. And, and yeah. we learned about, you know, their, his business challenges, it's a sole proprietor. And after understanding how he could really benefit from some other things that we had been considering doing, we created an entirely new product and it was really just to solve some challenges that we weren't going to solve with something else. Mm -hmm. So those conversations are critical, I think, to a good partnership and driving value on both sides. Conversations. I've heard that theme coming through quite a bit, actually. Conversations, <laughs> having the conversations, understanding, choosing to actually understand what the customer needs even if they're expressing a need in a different way than what you come to understand that they really should want and helping them understand how to get to that better outcome for them. I love that. I like that, Rob. Let's close with that. And, and, and Rob, 
I, uh, I want to close with giving you a chance to let folks know if they want to tap into this wisdom. I got to enjoy it here for a half hour, but if they want to learn more about you, if they want to learn more about your approach to customer experience, if they want to learn more about Next in Q or learn or hear some episodes of Next in Q, how might folks get in touch with you to learn more? I mean, I think uh, LinkedIn is a great start. Uh, you can find me there. I'm the black and white uh, face with the blue background. If there are, I don't know if there are more than <laughs> one Rob Dwyer, there probably are. Um, you can go to happytu.com, H A P P I T U.com. Um, Next in Q is available anywhere that you want to listen to podcasts, including YouTube. Uh, and if you use the new YouTube uh, URL, it's youtube.com slash at Next in Q. So awesome. uh, any of those ways you can, uh, you can check us out. Awesome. Well, I will get all of that in the show notes. So no one had to take any notes. You just click those links, get right over to Rob's wisdom information about happy to and next in Q as well. Rob, it was a really enjoyable conversation. I, I enjoyed talking about AI and, and, uh, getting it right, like getting into AI for the right reasons and getting those goals right. And then what should those goals be? I certainly enjoyed learning about your approach to how umpiring influenced and surprising me by how umpiring influenced your approach to the customer today. And conversations, right? It, as you said, it is all about conversations. And I, I find that incredibly valuable. So Rob, I really do appreciate you being on the show today. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. Rob, thank you for being on CX Passport. You are welcome, and I look forward to uh, having that steak while sitting outdoors with you. Thanks for joining us this week on CX Passport. If you liked today's episode, I have three quick next steps for you. Click subscribe on the CX Passport YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. Next, leave a comment below the video or a review in your favorite podcast app so others can find and enjoy CX Passport too. Then head over to cxpassport.com for show notes and resources that can help you create tangible business results by delivering great customer experience. Until next time, I'm Rick Denton, and I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Passport.